you. Um, well, I think I have the distinction of being the tallest, <laughs> but also probably the youngest percent presenter up here. Um, and I think, I think giving thanks to a lot of the brave thinkers in this room that have really paved the way in front of me to, to give this presentation and allow me to, to, to develop my own voice in this, in this emerging field. And I think a lot of those people have worked in, in, in challenging times. They worked working against cultures and traditions that didn't really accept a lot of their thoughts. So I, I really want to thank them. And then this talk is a little bit about the future, um, moving forward and thinking about some of the questions that I have in, in, my, in my own mind about where, we're, where we can go and what we can do in the future. But to give a little bit of context, this, this talk really began about 20 years ago. It really began with my first incidence with pain, an encounter that, unlike Lorimer's talk, I didn't really ever figure out what that was all about. But it really shut me down in terms of a lot of the things and got me away from a lot of the things that I really enjoyed in my life. Um, it was the uncertainty around how that experience felt that really changed my life in a, in a powerful way. And it was the experience I had some good rehabilitation experiences and some not so good that really drove me to go back and get a degree in, in physical therapy. Um, and when I, when I graduated um, with my degree in, in physical therapy, I, I, felt, I felt like I'd learned a lot about physiology and biology, a little bit about pain, not that much, but I felt, you know, somewhat certain I, I, could, I could work with individuals in pain and, and know what I was doing. But it was really subsequent to that when I was, as a clinician, working. Um, the experiences like most of us have had in this room, the patients, and thinking about the patients that, that were getting away from us, thinking about the patients that weren't showing up after their fourth visit. And I wasn't hearing about it, but I was wondering what, what happened to them. And the more classes that I took, the more continuing education, the more gurus and people that I sought out, people that were respected leaders in the field, this was happening to everybody, not just me. And I kind of asked a lot of critical questions of these people, and I wasn't really getting great answers. Um, and so my, the last four years of my experience, I, I, I worked in a, um, in a, in a clinic uh, just very similar to Raven Sara's. Uh, it was a level one trauma center. I worked at, with refugees. I worked with um, individuals in the underserved community. Um, a lot of homeless patients, a lot of complex trauma. And I was working with these individuals and I didn't really have a team behind me. So I had to develop a lot of these skills and figure out a lot of this stuff on my own. And that's really kind of formed the impetus for where I think we can possibly go. So kind of an overview for this talk, I want to start with rethinking our target for pain. And it's going to be a, a question at the end of this that we'll try to get, try to, get to an answer somewhat by the, by the end of this talk. But fundamental to, to working towards that an answer is trying to understand what this uncertainty of pain is. And then trying to decode that uncertainty and understand it in the clinical, the clinical realm, the clinical encounter, in your everyday encounters. What does uncertainty look like? not just for the patient, but also for ourselves. Our uncertainty comes up for us as well because we don't necessarily know what to do with all these patients. And then as we work, the second half of this talk is going to be a little bit more applied, hopefully, um, but really starting with what I think is the most important part of the rehab process for pain is the importance of expression. We'll talk about why that is and then some of our behaviors as clinicians um, that would either suppress or frustrate this expression of pain. And then sort of my game plan, uh, some of the things that I, that I developed, how I thought about these patients. And really this is kind of a synthesis of what I think a lot of people have brought, brought, brought up here already, a lot of great thinkers. And we're all kind of working on different pieces of this. And I've been inspired by a lot of the different individuals up here. Um, and just and talk about, then the last part, talking about persistent pain. I think Lormer talked about sort of scientific disclosure. I'm, I'm a, a graduate student in, in psychology, not clinical psychology, but experimental psychology from a more social perspective. So I'm really interested in how groups 
partners interact, groups of people interact with the individual, and that's really what I'm interested in. So while there will be some pictures of the brain up here, I'm really focusing on a different level of analysis and coming working back to the individual and individual behavior, because that's what I think we're all really interested in. But starting with this rethinking pain, I mean, we're all familiar with this sort of pain model here, where we start with an organic pain stimulus, leads to a pain experience, a private experience that we all have within ourselves, and this gets generates an expression of pain. And that expression of pain in the, in the, in the expressed in the context of a treatment provider, that provider listens to this and tries to attack the organic stimulus with the hope that the, the steps in the middle sort of fall out or, or, or um, take care of themselves. And we've, we've learned in the last 50 years or so that this isn't this isn't that great of a model, that there's some holes in it. First hole, obviously we all know this one, pain doesn't equal tissue damage. Don't need to spend too much more time on this one today with you guys. But the second one, the pain experience doesn't necessarily equal the expression of pain. And what, what, is this, what does this really mean? I mean, this is something I don't know if we're all so familiar with, but I'm really interested in this question. And to understand this question, I want just think about a time in your life when you've had an experience of pain, and think about what you did with that experience. Did you express it or did you not express it? Did you tell someone about it or did you not tell someone about it? And if you did tell someone, how did that expression change from one person to the next? That's a lot of what we find in some of the experimental pain research, that we see this expression change from, if you're talking to perhaps a doctor or provider, your partner, a child or a stranger on the street, we see this expression change. We're not, not necessarily sure why, why all the time. So based on this, and we're really going to talk about the difference between the expression and the experience of pain. I think we really need to rethink where we've aimed ourselves in terms of the target of our interventions. Like, what are we really getting at? And why are we getting that, going there? I think classically, we've looked at targeting the alleviation of pain. That's been the classic target. And I think even within this t the talks that I've heard, I haven't really, I think there's always been this underlying assumption, not with everyone here, and I think we all kind of maybe understand this, but the alleviation of pain is rampant. And I think, I think it's easy to get in that cycle. And I think the, 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 the evidence out there for actually treating this is not great. I, I mean, I grabbed these stats. I'm not going to read them so much. I'll put them up there. But we're all familiar with the, the picture out there in terms of what it looks like in terms of working with individuals. And as you look at the effect sizes of our interventions, they're not, they're not great. They're not great targeting, getting that pain number from an eight to a six to a four to a two and so on and so forth. So, so the alleviation. And this is a kind of a paradox because we now live in the most technologically advanced society. We have the most power in terms of medicine, in terms of surgery, antibiotics, anesthesia, things that we never had before. But we still seem to be a little bit kind of caught up here, and like, why is that? And so in answering where we should be going in terms of, should we be targeting the alleviation of pain or not targeting it, we're going to kind of leave that aside for a second and start to, to, to work towards at least what I think is my answer, or part of that answer. I wouldn't say it's my answer. It's many people's answers. But um, and really starting with the aversive uncertainty of pain. And in order to do that, I want to, I want to throw up the IASP definition of pain. I want us to all read it together and look for uncertainty in this definition and see if we see it. So kind of everyone together here, let's read through it so we can kind of get it all in our head. So it's an unpleasant sensory emotional experience or perfect. Great. So where do we see uncertainty here? Right, right between the two words. Thank you, Diane. That was, so it's right between these two words, the actual or potential. This is where uncertainty really, this, this blank space. And if we think back to Lorimer's example, the second time when he's walking through the bush with the boring talker, you know, we, he, he feels the twig on his, uh, on his leg, and he jumps up, and he's writhing in pain. He's, and we think back to that, and then he looks at his ankle and he sees that it was just a scratch. Now, how did he know that it wasn't a snake bite? Obviously, he looked at his ankle, 
And he was able to assess that. And as, as our, our training as clinicians, we're able to assess that answer for ourselves a lot of the time. But I think the important part is that our patients can't really assess that. They, they struggle at this point of uncertainty. In the seconds that follow the initial start of their painful experience, uncertainty fills their mind. And it doesn't necessarily manifest as, as specifically uncertainty, but this is the uncertainty that they don't know is it actual or potential damage that they're experiencing. So what do they do? And I think, we have a brain, I think we have a, a biological program for a couple of specific behaviors that we, that we do. And one specific one is we look outward. We look outward to the world to help us answer this question, the context that we're in. But everything in, our, in the context surrounding us is not equal. Certain things are more salient to us than others. From an evolutionary, or at least an anthropological perspective, there's been individuals in our lives that we've always tried to pay attention to more so than other people. These people, before medicine was as powerful as it is today, had a certain role in society, in cultures and groups. These shaman, these medicine men, they helped individuals wrestle with the uncertainty of, of the experiences they dealt with. They helped give them labels. They helped ascribe meaning to these things. From a developmental standpoint, when the first time a, a child was running, a toddler was running, and scrapes his knees, falls, trips, and scrapes his knees, does he cry immediately? Right, he, they look. They look to their mothers and fathers. They look at them. And it's based on the reaction that's coming back that they, do, they get an appraisal of themselves. They're looking outward to find out what's going on inward. And these are the symbols associated with the people like us in this room that people are going to when they're trying to resolve this sort of uncertainty. And so this is kind of the, 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 the heart of the questioning that goes on in our patient's brain. In our patient's brain, and it gets exhibited in their behavior. So how do we plot a course through, through this uncertainty, from this uncertain starting point to, to a certain end point? Obviously, the alleviation of pain has been one thing we focus on, but how do we pro, pro, get through this? The challenge is that uncertainty is aversive. It's both aversive for the patient. They don't want anything to do with it a lot of the times. And we sometimes don't want anything to do with it. And that's the challenge. We want to see them get better. And when they're not getting better, that's sort of aversive for us as well. And a lot of the patients that I've worked with in the, in the previous talk, it's, sometimes there's not a clear roadmap. There's not a protocol that we can follow. There's not necessarily a specific set of invent, interventions for this specific person at this specific time. So how do we figure this, figure this out together with the patient? How do, we, how do we answer this question of uncertainty? And that's really where we're, where we're going. So I think to, to, let's put ourselves back into our patient's brain and think about, in addition to when they come to you and they're, they're saying their pain's at eight out of 10, it's in their neck and it hurts all the time, what are some of the things that come along with, the, with, with this expression of pain? These may not always come out all the time. They may not always be right there on the surface. But questions like, will I lose my job? Will my partner still love me? Can I still be as active as I once was? These are some of the questions, I think, that are just lying just beyond um, our patient's expression of pain. And how do we decode this? Because we can't, it's difficult to answer these questions. I think sometimes as, as clinicians, we can feel somewhat uncomfortable when these things really come out in, a, in their strong form. So how do, we, how, do we, how do we answer this question? Well, I think it starts with peeling back the layers and looking at the, the basic root of all these questions. And it starts with this simple question, am I all right? I think that that's a fundamental part of all those bigger questions. And how do we answer that? Well, I think that's what we're really what our training is designed to answer. And we really, really embody in that answer and really respecting what we know and what we don't know um, is huge, and we, we've heard from multiple people earlier today trying to, or throughout this entire conference, answer this question through different modalities, through touch, through the, the, through the use of movement, but it's really this fundamental question. But we need to make connections with this simple question to these other ones. Am I all right? Will I lose my job? Will my partner still love me? How do we make this connection with our patients? Well, we do it through patients' values, and 
I like, I like this idea of values, but I also kind of don't like it because you hear it a lot and it's sort of like, ah, values, values, what is that? You know, it's hard to understand. It's like a, it's just used a lot. It sort of loses its meaning with how much it's been used. But we're going to kind of talk about what those values are. And in order to understand what these, these values are, I think it's under, uh, important to understand what happens within this context of pain with these values. And so here's this uh, Schwartz in 1994, a sociologist, tried to, he polled a bunch of people uh, throughout the world and tried to create this universal values, values kind of grid. And I think what it's important to remember is that people start avoiding the activities that they value the most when, when they're in pain because they start getting stuck in the expression, stuck in trying to answer this uncertainty of pain because for whatever reason, the way that they're, the interactions that they're having in their life with the providers that they're having aren't really fundamentally getting at this question. And so they get stuck and they start avoiding things like st stimulation, self-direction, um, being with other people. Um, these things are tremendously important parts of people's lives and we don't necessarily, um, without really having a conversation with them, we don't know how these things are being affected. We can assume what values are, but I don't know if we, all, we always do a very good job discussing it. And I think to really get after it, we have to bring the values into the treatment context. I mean, in terms of being with other people, this is a bigger risk factor for health. I mean, I mean social isolation is a bigger risk factor for health than, 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 than smoking. And self-direction is another value of, you know, just feeling, feeling successful with one's work and with one's productivity, stimulation, achievement, being able to run you know, a, a, a marathon in three hours or lift, you know, snatch 225 pounds. These are values that, that our patients are getting away from. And I think, well, those are actually goals that I just I listed, but we're going to get in the difference between goals and values, but these are sometimes how these, 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 uh, these goals are how these values are being represented. But the point is, is that people start to avoid these things. So, Changing the destination. This was the destination, and I think alleviation of pain, whatever I think we need to aim at is a return to value living and how we start making this a part of our practice, how we start including this into the discussion. We don't, you know, as I mentioned, I'm in psychology, but I don't think we need to be psychologists in every sense of the word, but we do need to embody, because I think there's a space between where psychology stops and physical therapy starts that's open that's open for us to take if we should should we choose to accept accept this sort of mission so changing the destination for me in my practice has involved four steps the first step is allowing for the patient's full expression of pain not getting in the way of it allowing for it to happen and, and trying to bring it out as best i can Answering the patient's question, am I all right? If I can't answer it, I try to find someone that can or gives me the information that I can feel confident to answer that question, am I all right? And then using the patient's expression, using their full expression to really get at the values in their life. To not assume, to not infer about what these values are, but to really get at them. And then align our goals, our actions, our interventions with these values and really working with them. And it, in the clinical context. So the importance of expression. I think just to really highlight why this is so important to me and why it's, I think, so just the, probably the most important part of this talk is really looking at um, this quote by Patrick Wall. And I think we're, some of us are familiar with this, but he says, if, if the sequence of pain is frustrated at any stage, the sensation and posture remain, or the behavior remains. And I think we, we look at this Expression is a key part of the sequence. We start looking at it as it's, it's, it's a key part, just like the infant who, who's running and trips and looks to his mother. What if his mother's not there? And I kind of thought about this, this question that I had is in relationship to this, but is, is, the, is the actual physical, physical hurt that happens worse than the actual social hurt from not having anyone come up to you afterwards or not having anyone to express your pain afterwards, which one is actually worse? And I, I sort of think it's probably the latter, but um, all things being equal, of course. But so in order to understand that, what is, 
what is this idea of frustration and related to expression? Well, here we have a more metaphorical brick wall, and this brick wall is really, frustration is anything that forms a physical and emotional, emotional or communicative barrier to one's pain's expression. And some of these frustrations might be monetary, access to health care, you know, co-pays, co-insurance, all these kind of things that surround our health care system, especially here in the U.S. These can be potential frustrations of our patients can't access people to help them answer these questions. Other, other frustrations, transportation, working with the underserved. I'd have patients that would take two bus transfers, four hours, just to come see me for a half an hour in the snow in Denver to answer these questions about their body, to have someone listen to them. I was like incredibly powerful experience because I, 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 I was always in awe at that. And I think this is huge um, for a lot of our patients because a lot of people aren't, aren't working that hard. It's, that's a, a small portion of the people out there. And, and just a history of warm and empathetic relationships. One of the things I think we're starting to learn, especially from the, from the brain science, is that a lot of the same higher order areas that process social hurts, social hurts being by exclusion, hostility, um, neglect, are also, also, process, also process physical hurts. And if an individual like a patient has a history of of some of these things. They may be looking at you as a, as a clinician with skepticism. They may ramp down their expression of pain because they don't even trust you or view, like, or view it as a, as, a, as a trusting relationship. So that, that's present. And our goal is not to necessarily try to make diagnoses about this, but just to understand that these things are out there. And they're not our patient's fault. It's, they're, they're not our patient's fault. This is the fault of all the accumulation of experiences, but a lot of this stuff is not, is not of their choosing. For an occupational setting, having doctors or case managers or providers that are, that are doubting your, your injury, and by extension of your injury, your expression of pain. Really, 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 really frustrations towards getting it out. So what does this look like? Here we have an individual saying, I'm in pain, I'm in pain, of a provider, and we have this frustration in the middle. Whatever this frustration is, and I think this manifests for me as, as, as a specific patient. This patient is the patient that comes to you, and you sit down with them, and you, and you, you, haven't, you haven't showed them a, a, a pain scale, zero to 10, you know, anything like that, no happy faces, no sad faces. And, and they're already telling you their pain's a 12, a 12 out of, 12 out of 10, a 15 out of 10. And you're like, I think, I think the common thing that we, we're, we're instinctively do is like, well, I'm going to recalibrate this. And it's, let's say you work in a healthcare system where you can rule out a lot of, you know, you can kind of look through the medical records. You see this as a persistent thing. So you're not necessarily thinking this person needs to go to the ED, at least in this moment right here. But you're like, I'm going to get at this. I'm going to recalibrate. And so a 10 out of 10, you know, that's, that's, that's child labor. That's, that's uh, you know, that's getting your arms sawed off with a dull spoon. That's a 10 out of 10. Like, what are you? And I think that's, not the, that's the wrong way to be approaching these patients, because that's just another form of doubt. That's another frustration that they're, they're, they're expecting that they're going to feel. And so I think trying to, our job as providers is to break through this brick wall, or at least poke holes in it, to allow that person to see that the expression, their, their expression of pain is getting through to somebody. And that's hard. That's hard work. It doesn't always make sense. It's messy. I mean, I think we just heard from a great speaker that's been trying to do that across language barriers, across, um, yeah, it's incredible. It's incredible how difficult this is, but I think we have to understand that's our challenge. So frustrations in physical therapy. These are some of the things I've been a part of that I've definitely done in the past. These are things that um, I've seen, seen around me. But scheduling, how hard is it for your patients to come see you? How quickly can they come see you? Is there a long wait list? Right there along with this is there's numerous providers that the, that the patient's seen before their simple question, am I all right, is answered. Are they just going to a, a PCP who's providing um, you know, analgesics in with the idea that, ah, why don't you give physical therapy a try? Maybe that'll work. You know, is that really answering some of their deep questions about are they all right? I mean, some providers do a great job, but not everybody. And then afterwards, are you handing them to a PT8 or PTA right afterward, after you've kind of taken their subjective, and they're still trying to express a lot, of, a lot of their uncertainty, a lot of their, am I all right? And is this person really quali qualified to answer this, this question? Um, what happens there? Our own discom discomfort with the emotions associated with pain. Pain is an emotional 
process. It, it, it takes over our lives and all those aspects that I mentioned earlier. And if we're not comfortable with the emotions that, that associate with pain, what are we doing to that patient's expression? If we're, if we're making a joke or we're trying to distract the patient or we're trying to um, change the subject or put them on the exercise bike, what is that doing to their expression of pain? So how do we, be, how do we become more comfortable with this? And I think, I think it starts with looking inward at ourselves and sort of saying, why is this uncomfortable for me um, as the provider? Other frustrations. Do we really listen? Are we just sort of parsing through what the patient's saying and looking for specific kind of key words, burning, sharp, stabbing? Now, those are the key words we're trying to parse out, a number. Or do we try to, you know, and then we're trying to take those key words and just apply a label, a diagnosis based on some other things, but are we really kind of not taking the gestalt of their expression, the entire thing? So, and then finally, do we focus on, focus on function in the absence of values? I mean, we are been grilled with function. Thanks to some of the things that, 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 that John talked about in terms of function, function, function. But, so what are values? I think they just lie just beyond these objective goals. But we often infer what these values are because we all maybe look the same. We have the same skin color. But I don't think that's true. I think it goes beyond just our skin color and our, our similar classes. We have to we have to really not make assumptions about what these are and learn to have discussions about them. Finally, do we promise things that we can't deliver, mainly the alleviation of pain? And how this manifests for me and what I've seen is the patient that, that comes to you and uh, the, the patient that comes to you and say, you say to them, you know, I can get you better in four visits, six visits, eight visits, whatever it is. And let's say that doesn't happen. Maybe, maybe their pain's the same, maybe it's a little bit better, but it's, it's not where they want it to be at the time frame that you, you outlined. Where's your trust with that patient then? What's going on there? It's probably lower. I think most of us would agree that that's where it would be at. But a lot of our patients are walking out the door and they're on to the next provider and then the next provider. And I think we really, that's not the model that should be working. That's, that's part of the problem is people get trapped in this expression of pain. They're not working through this with anybody. And so we, I think we need to drop this alleviation of pain as our primary goal. I mean, I think we're fortunate that patient, patients, just by the act of being next to us, do feel better. And a broad, like, broad aspect of patients do feel better after working with us. I'm not saying that doesn't happen. I'm just saying, and we shouldn't still appreciate that process, but we gotta cut ourselves some slack. I think the more slack we cut ourselves, the, the better that we feel about this, the better we're gonna treat our patients and the better thinking we're gonna have about our patients. So what should we be doing? Uh, just to recap, eliminate, eliminate the frustrations of, of pain as best we can. Identify them if you can. Um, try not to make assumptions about these. Try to involve the patient, but sometimes you have to anticipate things when there's a language barrier, when there's a cultural barrier bringing your cultural competency up, up to speed. Director, all our, an, our actions at answering these, this simple question, am I all right? And if you can't answer that, then you gotta get this person to someone that you can't, if you don't feel confident answering this question. And there's, there's certain cases where you need a team to answer this question. And that's what we saw with the interdisciplinary care, is really circling the wagons around this patient and saying, yeah, you're all right, and here's a whole team behind me that's saying the same thing. So then we discuss values with the patient. We align out these values with the patient's life. So kind of I wanted to go through my, how, how this looks throughout the entire course of the care, starting with the examination. Allowing for the full expressions of one pain. That's obvious at this point. I've said it like three times. Um, don't interrupt it. Ask open-ended questions. Look for fix, fixed expressions of pain. There's kind of two, two, two di di a dichotomy of two different patients or, that we can think about here. One is the one that talks to you for 45 minutes of the hour or even that whole hour. These people are great. I love this because this is like, I get to sit back and just give them my attention. I get to listen to them. And I don't, and, it, and, that, and I just get to take in their expression. And then there's the other person that says, my pain's in my neck and it hurts when I do this. And they're not, they're not giving you anything more than that. That's actually the more difficult patient because now I got to figure out especially if this patient is, um, 
yeah, just saying this over and over, and I, I'm trying to kind of, you know, how is this affecting your life? How can we, you know, what is this pain to you? Really trying to get at what's, how in the bigger picture is this, is this, uh, is this is affecting their life. So, and then not, not discouraging emotion. I mean, I don't think we need to think that everyone needs to go through a huge catharsis. You know, they don't need to be in a puddle of tears after they come see you. That's, that's the, the route to, to getting better. I think that's the wrong sort of message if you're taking away the, that from me thus far. But I think we, if that train's coming towards us, we need to recognize it and we need to allow it to come, come. And we need to be comfortable, and we need to have the skill set to allow that to come. And if you're not comfortable with that, then I think you need to seek out the training that's going to make you a little bit more comfortable. Um, there's not a lot of resources for that, but I'll put some at the end and, um, that I've found helpful. In terms of examination, moving to a little bit more of our objective measures. Quality over quantity. My, my goal is just to simply assess how willing they're to want to participate in this sort of joint endeavor. Just trying to get an assessment for how willing they can move. If I, I just ask them to do kind of a, a standard motion assessment, but I'm not thinking biomechanically at this point. I'm just thinking willingness. What are they giving me? What, am I, what do I have to work with? Um, there's limited special tests. We don't have a ton of special tests for pain, so I don't even think about them really. And I'm really, the special test that I do think about, it's really about ruling out versus diagnosis. I don't make diagnoses in terms of pain. I just try to rule out the big bad stuff that has severe consequences. If I don't get this addressed, it's really bad for the patient. And those people, I try to get to the people that they need to be seen. Moving to the prognosis and explanation. I think this is really where I start messaging that things are all right, right now. I don't start with any other tense, the future tense. I just start with right now. And these complex, some of the complex orthopedic trauma patients I saw tremendous social upheaval coming at the same time as tremendous physical upheaval, it's difficult to parse out all the different variables that you're confronted with. But what I would try to do is just, right here, right now, this is the best place for you to be. I've got, you've got my 100% attention, I'm on your side, and we're gonna work through this together. And just try to create that, this, this idea of safety. But in terms of messaging, I have to keep the door open for pain, to be there, for, to be persistent. I, as my own example, my own experience with pain, it's lasted for the, la the better part of this last 20 years for myself. And I have to keep this door open for persistent pain to occur because I want this patient to stay with me through these rough times. I don't want them walking out the door when, when they encounter a hard time. You know, and I think every, every patient's got the right to, to choose other providers and find the person that works with them the best, but they need to work through some of this stuff with somebody, not just bounce around. Um, it doesn't mean you have to be excessively positive. I, um, so in terms of this idea of like this forecasting, this is kind of where I'm aiming. Not like it's always sunny in San Diego or it's snowing boatloads in, in, the, the, in, in New England, but it's somewhere more like the Northwest where it's partially sunny to cloudy, a little bit of chance of sour showers most days of the week. That's really what I'm aiming for in terms of a metaphorical kind of prediction about what they're, what they're going to experience. Um, and then kind of in terms of how I deliver this, it's really, it's really not about always the content. It's really about the delivery. Most of our processing is outside of our awareness, whether that, and that includes verbal communication. When we're taking this information in, it's not really always the ideas that are the most salient. After all, most of our patients have all sorts of crazy ideas. We've heard all this stuff. They believe this stuff just as much as they believe a lot of other things. But it's really how we deliver these messages and how we give them important feedback is really important. I think ideas matter and, and being less wrong matters. But I think it's also a lot more in how we deliver this stuff. So I, the delivery process and really I, understanding the power of sort of behavioral mimicry. When, and put, to put this in a clinical uh, example, if you have a, a patient that's sitting across from you, and let's say they are tearing up, they are getting very distressed about the, the experience of their pain. What I do is I sit across from them and I, and I look at them with, without a worried look, without a look that I've got to do, you know, I'm going to have to do, you know, an hour of paperwork at the end of the day and I need to get through this appointment as fast as I can. I don't have that expression on my face. I just look at them that, with, with calmness, that I, almost an encouragement 
that yes, I want to hear everything that you have to say to me. And, and I really call this pro process modeling confident equanimity. It's just being calm and composed in the presence of all their uncertainty. What this does is it starts, to, it's just, it starts the process of contradicting all their distress or surrounding their pain. It starts sending powerful messages back to them that start saying, that, yes, everything is all right right now. This, I'm telling this person the worst parts of my life. And, and this person's taking it, and they're not freaking out. And this is already starting to contradict some of this stuff that's going on with them. It's a part of the process. It's a sequence in this, all the steps. So we talked about values and how, why they're so important. I kind of alluded to this slide here, but really making the distinction between what a value is and what a goal. So a value for me is a process that one lives one's life by. It's not an outcome. Like my goal, or my, excuse me, my value is to be close to my family. That's not going to ever happen in one moment. I'm not going to achieve this magical nirvana with my family in one moment. It's got to happen you gotta have to inst moment by moment throughout my life. A goal, a goal is an ob objective result. It's something that we can sort of mark off, something we can sort of make a tick in our life and say, yes, I did that. I ran a marathon in three hours or four hours. I did this activity. I climbed Mount Everest. These are obvious. These are results. But the, the issue is, is that many values can be the same, but they're manifested through different goals. If we have the, end of, the patient who's, who's running you know, 15 miles, they're getting pain at mile six, um, and they keep running, blowing past that barrier. This is the individual. And you're starting to have a. You're trying to tell them just slow down, just slow down. They're not slowing down. They just keep. They just keep running. It's like, why are you running? What are you? What are you running from? What's going on here? What are you chasing? Um, really trying to get at that and sort of say, what is this? And 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 I think if you can have a discussion about whatever that is, I think you can start to say, well, I, I fully appreciate what you're going after here. But maybe for the time being, we need to take a break from that and look at some of these other things in your life. Trying to treat, treat a, crea a creative relationship between goals and values. So you're trying to foster that with the patient. Bring that out and have a discussion about it. It's not always easy, is it? I'm trying to, trying to make it sound up here. Sometimes it's really hard. And it doesn't always, it doesn't always work out. But you're trying. That's the thing that matters. Um, talking about interventions now, I mean, I think Diane done a great job, so I'm not going to go into much of this, but I really think these embodied interventions are thinking about the whole behavior of the individual when you're working with someone. In terms of touch, in terms of contact, I mean, this is a subconscious way, and probably, perhaps the power, most powerful way in the present tense, right here, right now, of communicating this message that everything is all right, that everything right here, right now. And that's what I'm trying to do with my hands. I call kind of the work I do with my hands, hands without hype. I'm not trying to hype up what I do with the patient. I'm not trying to make this technique look like the best thing. Almost my hands flow, my hands and words flow seamlessly together. That's my goal. I'm trying to get everything to be seamless, but not have the patient get fixated on what my hands are doing. Um, um, I'm not going to really go too much. Diane did a great job with that. Um, kind of moving a little bit more towards movement. The uh, um, I really like movement. I've always really been sort of captivated by it. But I want to think about movement just sort of communicating that everything can be all right right now while you're actually enacting, interacting with the world in a meaningful way. We're getting you off the, the plinth. We're getting you out of the conversation. We're interacting with the world. And we're also going to be sending messages that it is all right right now at the same time. So in the next couple of slides, I got this little graph. I did this animation. And how this is going to work, this is your total possible emotion. You've got pain on one side. You've got um, pain-free motion. I go through kind of three different patients here. First patient is the patient that's not respecting the pain experience. That was supposed to move. Why isn't that moving? Oh, that one's moving. OK. Let's try this again. There we go. So this is the patient, the runner that I described earlier. They're blowing past their barrier when, they're, when they start to experience pain. They're not respecting their own experience. For whatever reason, whatever value they're chasing, whatever, whatever um, goal that leads to that value, they're just going ouch, 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 all the way into your clinic. This is a little bit less common, but they're out there. I think this is a little bit more common, avoiding the pain experience. And it's important that we can think about this scale both in terms of a, a, a simple joint moving, entire movement pattern, 
or the entire behavior of the individual in terms of and towards a goal or towards a value. But this is the individual who's avoiding it. They, they've experienced that pain. They don't want nothing to do with it. They're on the other side of the room. They're like, I'm not even going near that experience anymore. And they're avoiding it. And th here's what we see is that pain starts to take up more space in this person's life. And it's really trying to avoid, avoid this. So we're trying to get them out of this. And this is really my goal. This is how simple I think about things. It's really to get people interacting with their pain experience. Much like Corey did, um, and that's part of the reason why I was so inspired by the work of Corey, is really interacting with this painful experience. We're moving up towards that painful experience and we're backing off, we're moving up, backing off. And I'll explain things on these terms because I want to have a conversation about this because I think this is something our patients can understand when it's this simple. But we're moving up, we're backing away, and we're moving up, backing away. Sometimes we go past it, we get an ouch, and then we move away. But this, now we start to perhaps push this barrier a little bit. Some people this moves more than other times, but at least we're having a conversation about it. Um, embodied interventions in terms of education. I mean, this is really great stuff. I've taken the courses by Adrian Lowe. I've read Explain Pain. This is the, the direct route of convincing the patient that pain doesn't equal tissue damage. This is the verbal route. And it's, it's, it's very important to me. I've also made the mistake of jumping in this stuff too quickly, too fast. The patient's expressing to me I'm already trying to say, oh, I know what this is all about. This is nerves, this is your brain, this is all this stuff. And I think that really overpowers that patient's expression. So you have to do this tactfully and carefully. And really look at this as a staged process where all you're trying to do is communicate one simple message. And you can use multiple modalities to communicate that message that, that, that the patient is all right. So it's really about waiting, waiting for the appropriate moment and integrating that education throughout your kind of entire um, rehabilitation scheme. And talking about persistent pain, because I think we have to learn how to change the conversation, or what I call kind of changing gears. I think even for me, I have the implicit hope that people will feel better when they're done with me. But sometimes I've, I've borne born witness to that's not always the case, but I'm fortunate that people continue to work with me through this stuff. But we have to figure out how to change gears. We have to figure out, get that implicit hope that things will be different and have a conversation about that, what that means and how do we experience that. And I think for me it's, I think Kara used my metaphor, stole my metaphor, but it's, um, it's really getting that angry taxi, taxi cab driver out of the front seat and turning him into an annoying backseat driver. Yes, he's in your life. Yes, he, he, he's, he's annoying a lot of the time, but you can still get to go where you want to go. You know, you have to deal with them, but you still get to go where you want to go. And that's really what our goal is. And then, as I mentioned earlier, just the, being careful with diagnostic, um, diagnostic certainty. Um, this really starts with the foundation. That's really patient rapport. I didn't throw these words up here, therapeutic alliance, working alliance in the beginning, but that's really what we're talking about here. This is the process that I go about to get there. This is how I conceptualize it. But this is the stuff in the literature that you might, you might see. Um, it's built slowly over time. What I try to do is you, you generally use interventions that, that can be perceived as low risk before I move to high risk. So what this looks like is the patient that's a total knee arthroplasty that comes to you two weeks after um, being discharged from the hospital, hasn't seen anybody. And you're thinking, well, I gotta, I, gotta, I gotta get this person moving. Or say you're seeing some more complex multi-trauma patient that they have all sorts of orthopedic injuries and you really have to get people moving because there's a window where things are going to really start to get stiff. But they're also in a tremendous amount of physical and social pain at this time. What is the most important thing you do in, this first, in these first moments? I think the old school approach was to push as hard as you can. Not, I mean, that's a bit of an exaggeration, but we still see it. And I, I've, been, I've done that. And you push these patients right, outside, right, out, right out your clinic door because you're not building the rapport first. You're not really connecting. And I'd rather have someone that's maybe not reaching the gains that I think it's really a trade-off. It's like, well, how far can I get, but can I keep them with me this entire way? Um, it's challenging to figure out. And I don't know if there's always a right answer, but you just, if you're aware of the process, I think you can try to make the best decision at the time you can. And keeping the door open for pain to persist. I don't, I don't think we give people the negative expectation that this is always the result, but we have to allow it to occur. We have to allow things to unfold. That this idea, and we have to respect the amount of literature that's out there. Until we change society at a systemic level, I don't know if we can really 
change this fact because there's too much social trauma out there. There's too much physical trauma. People are always going to be experiencing it. So what I like to do is not focus on the alleviation of pain, patient symptoms. I try to, like I said, model confident equanimity. And I focus on the process, not the outcome. Some of the things that you've already heard. Sometimes I do normalize the expectation of a flare-up. I think that's key. I don't, you know, my, the biggest red flag is if I get a patient that comes see me and after two, you know, two visits, three visits, they've had pain for like years beforehand, they're feeling great. We've all had this patient. They're doing, they're, 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 they're you know, they're high flying. You know, for me, I see this blow up my face a lot of time because I'm like, yes. You know, when I was younger, yes, yes, you're doing great. And then I never hear from them again. Maybe I, I hear that they're all flared up and they're really angry at me. And I think it's really understanding that sometimes I, I, I plant that seed because I know that the first time they experience pain, they're going to get a lot of distress based, at, based on our interaction. So I try to plant this seed that sometimes it is normal that we do flare up. Um, so in summary, I think really we can make process even in the face of uncertain pain. Um, I think this really takes us examining ourselves as well as our patients and the things that we're comfortable with. I think this, this was really brought home for me in a conversation actually this, this week with Keith. Um, he reminded me of this blog post that he wrote. And in his blog post, he sort of, he sort of talked about this experience with a patient that he had where he spent two hours talking with this patient, really getting into their lives. This was, he's a home health PT and really getting into this experience with this patient. And he went through this entire thing and at the very end he sort of lamented about the fact that, yeah, he didn't, he didn't really feel like he was helping anyone. And I, and I sort of wrote, wrote back to him and I said, you know what, I think you're a master clinician. I think that there's probably very few people that have the attention for, to, to do what you just did in your, and what you gave this person. And that I think that, that there's not many people willing to roll up their sleeves and get into this patient's sort of life and really try to sort things out for the patient. I mean, not, not that you're trying to sort things out and make, give them answers, but really just try to help that patient figure out for themselves what's really important. I think you did an excellent job. And I think it's this kind of thing that I'm actually targeting here. It's this, this, this lament that we, need, that we need to be always making process this process towards alleviation of pain. I think we need to free up our thinking around that simple feeling of lament. I think if we do that, we're going to really make some progress with our patients. And we're going to feel a lot better about it. And we're going to be at the end of a long week of seeing a lot of these, these difficult patients. And they're not going to be so hard because we're really trusting that the relationship is the most important thing. And we're going to feel better about that. And that's really what I came to at the end of my practice before I started going back to academia, but that's really what I want to get back to, and that's really what I'm passionate about. Um, and I think we can em embrace this. I think there's space. There's no one doing this work as well as we have the potential to do. So um, I think this stands for not only us as PTs, but it's a massage and across disciplines. This is not just for us to take over, but I think we all working together. So. I want to thank everybody. I think that's about time. These are some of the resources that I found really helpful in my own development as a clinician. Um, um, and so I wanted to include those. But I'm willing to take questions on anything. So thank you very much. Thank you. All right, so we have uh, about 10 to 15 minutes for questions here. Uh, and so, and before we get head off to lunch, so we again we've got a, a microphone that'll come around. So if you would please put your hands up, nice and high. Um, I'm going to take questions first from people that I haven't asked before. I've got a gentleman up here in the red shirt uh, towards the front, and then I've got another gentleman in the back in the blue shirt. Excuse me. And then we will come back. Great talk. Um, in the face of uncertainty, do you ever flip it upside down and ask them what they are certain about? Hmm. <laughs> yeah, you can do that. You can do that. I think you can sort of say, how are things been working for you? I mean, I see you're, you're coming into me and, you know, you, you listen to their expression. and You know, you try to sometimes make them aware of 
some, sometimes the word workable versus unworkable comes to mind. And if people are doing something that's very repetitive in terms of their behavior, in terms of opioids or, or health seeking in some way, I mean, I wouldn't use those terms explicitly with the patient, but if you can highlight some of the things that they're doing repetitively in a sort of a fixed manner, I think you can say, you can sort of try to pry open some space with the patient maybe around, okay, so you think this, but what kind of result are you getting from that? And especially in terms of if you try to highlight, if you've already had a discussion about some of their values, I think you can kind of try to try to draw a contradiction there between the two. Does that make sense? We got another gentleman in the back with blue shirt. Uh, great talk, thanks. Uh, I'm, I'm captivated by your concept of this full expression of the, the pain. I haven't heard that before, but I, I really like it. Um, and I, I'm glad you put up uh, the uh, acceptance and commitment there because I, could, I can see the the similarities. Uh, so when you're talking, uh, you know, when you're talking about full expression, um, I can see, yeah, both from the, uh, a therapist perspective where we may be rushing to start alleviating the pain or from the patient perspective where they might be rushing to alleviate the pain and both those things prevent the full expression. So you said um, trying to avoid getting in the way of fully expressing it. Do you ever find you have to encourage the full expression, where, and, and what, how does that work? Yeah, I mean, I think you, what I try to do is, is let the patient know I, that, I ha, that I have their full attention. They, they have my full attention. That means I'm not writing notes, copious notes. I'm not um, sitting at my computer. I'm, I'm trying to put, position myself right in front of them, fairly close, whatever I feel is like, you know, if I feel like they're moving away from me as I'm moving closer, I probably should back away. Um, so. I try to do some of these non non uh, nonverbal behaviors. I try to really try to control some of those in front of the patient as best as I'm, I can be aware of those. Um, you know, I think it's a it's a it's a tricky thing. It's a um, about because I think you can lean in a little too hard on that too. I mean, I I'm sort of using my idea in this talk is to is to push people to think this way, not necessarily they need to go all the way and take everything that I'm saying as the super little. But so I think you can lean in a little too far and, and that, I mean, most people, most of our patients, medicine's over here, psychology's over here, the two shall never meet, and they expect that too. So if we lean in real hard and we start sounding that's something that they're not expecting, yeah, they're gonna see that as a threat. They're gonna, they're, they're gonna start, you know, light bulbs are gonna go off that this is a threat to me in some way. So you gotta be careful, you gotta be subtle. Some people you don't have to be so subtle with. You, I think you have to use your judgment. You're gonna make mistakes, I've made mistakes, so that's how I, does that make sense? We have a, a, a question up here in the front row, and then uh, additional questions too. All right, I know you're on them. And one, two, three. Okay. Thanks, Eric, I'll be quick. It's a two-part question, fast. Okay. <laughs> so uh, how, how would you handle a patient who, um, in trying to navigate the conversation about how that patient is okay for right now, uh, when that person has had the question answered by someone prior to seeing you, but you're not satisfied with the appraisal they were given, or the patient who was reassured but then rejected that reassurance by somebody else? So the first, first question is, you may think that there's something else actually going on that, that sort, of, sort of like there's underlying diagnosis that needs to be made or? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that's challenging sometimes. I think you, you, you subtly try to contradict the power of that diagnosis. I'm all about contradiction. I'm all about trying to pry open space, but sort of say, you know, it really depends on what it is, whether I think they're, where they're really fixed at. I mean, it's a little bit like a sparring match sometimes. You kind of move towards the idea of their diagnosis, and then you, you get a sense that they're, they're acting a little bit like, kind of like getting a little angry with you or you can sense that in their, in their face, then I try to sort of say, okay, you know, we're gonna back off that, maybe try to move to more of a safe area. But you try to get at that, and sometimes it takes a couple sessions. Sometimes you plant the idea early on and you don't really go after it, but you just let them get to know you a little bit. I, you know, try to work somewhat softly in that department. Um, and the second question was that they've been given reassurance but they didn't accept it. Yeah, I mean, I definitely have seen a lot of that, um, or it comes, 
I think you just try to be real with patients. Sometimes I tell patients, like, we don't treat pain really that well. You haven't been treated well in the past. You know, I, whatever form, like, that, that makes sense. I mean, I try to modulate my ex reaction to them. I don't really say it like that, but I try to modulate it based on what I feel like might make sense to that patient based on some of my experience. But it's, that's hard, you know? It, sometimes it works, but at least you're trying. You're thinking that way. You're not thinking about the, you know, that's the thing about these biomechanics and all this other stuff. That stuff clouds your, your head. You should be thinking about this other stuff. And if you're thinking about all this other stuff, it's just taking up, you know, your, your space, your, your workspace to really think well about this patient. So I think it's about that really more than always finding the right answer. Hi there, um, Pam Holmes, and I'm just, I'm seeing your fear avoidance questionnaire and those different assessment tools. Where would you fit that in with your assessment? Would uh -huh. you do that, you know, when they first come in, fill out papers, or do you establish yeah. rapport with them first? Or? Sometimes they use that in the beginning. I don't use them all the time. I think that they're, if you're, if you're a fan of using some sort of standardized assessment, you can look at some of that stuff, and sometimes that can be helpful for, for giving you some red flags on maybe some things. They're not perfect instruments. They don't capture everything, but I think there's stuff that's out there. And I, I would say generally in the beginning, use it as a conversation so you might see how someone fills it out and then you sort of say, well, I see you, how you filled this out. I'm not really trying to track that change. I really use that maybe as a tool to sort of say, here's what I see, like why don't you, as an opportunity to have a discussion, really. Um, but usually in the beginning, before their first appointment with me while they're waiting in the waiting room. We got our next question over here. Can you put your hand up again, please? Or, no? Okay. All right. This gentleman here was going to be our next then. Okay, yep. And she will be our last one. Thank you for a good uh, presentation, Eric. Um, I have two small questions. First, uh, fixed expression of pain, What what is that? Something that's like repetitive, it's lacking variability. Like we talk about variability of movement, I think there can be variabilities of expression. So if you look at someone in there, you know, saying, oh, my pain's here, that's all it is all the time. It's, chances are it's more than that. And like I've had those patients that are just saying the same thing over and over again. Like I try to, try to get some variability in that expression. So trying to stimulate um, metaphoric kind of conversations about it. I don't say like, well, now we're gonna have a metaphoric conversation. <laughs> You know, I, I just sort of say, like, what is your pain like? You know, try to, try to ask what it's like, as opposed to sort of saying, tell me the number of your pain. Where's your pain at? Um, and what happens when you have that pain? And just sort of let them fill in. Thank you. Uh, also, you, you talk about the uh, patient's full expression of their pain. Right. Are you worried that, I, I think I, I would like an elaboration what how you do this, because a full uh, expression of pain, wouldn't that Put, frame the patient to feel his pain, and we know that just talking about pain sure. activates the nerve attack for pain. So could we possibly create pain from trying to express them, their full uh, experience? Oh, that's a really good, good question. Um, so my underlying assumption is we, it's really difficult to, to separate. Um, I can say anecdotally, I think most people in the room, if they think about the pain experiences I've had, they experience pain, they don't express it, and there's times when they express it, and they don't experience it, and that, that, that exists, that, that difference. But it's, we can't, I don't know how we really measure that. I mean, most of the brain scans is someone saying they're in pain, and we look at the brain at the same time. So, you know, we're, are, we, are we looking at their expression of pain, or are we looking at their, their pain, because they're expressing at the same time we're scanning their brain. It, it, I know there's some stuff that people are trying to make some work in that department, um, but I think that's, that's somewhat challenging. I think the full expression of pain is, uh, I might be getting away from your question, so if just, but is a sort of a, an idea to, to push you as a clinician to ask for a little bit more. Um, it's sort of conceptual. It's not, it's, not, it's not right 100%. There is no magical full 100% of expression. It's just trying to get more. And, and to answer your question now that just came back to me is, yeah, um, yeah, when you do give people attention, they're going to express more pain to you. It's going to happen. If you have the attention for it, it's going to happen more. But that's not the problem. I think we, we think about that as being the problem. That's, 
that's actually great, I, I think. It, it allows us to move past that stage in the sequence. And I really look at it as a stage sequence. So if you allow it to happen, then we get the opportunity to move past it. And I think that's the problem, in my opinion, that we're not allowing that to happen enough. But yeah, it's sort of paradoxical. You know, and it doesn't always jive well with the research if we're saying, you know, the researcher wants, wants to alleviate pain, alleviate the expression of pain, but then, you know, we're showing that if we give people attention, it, 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 they express it more. It kind of is confusing for some, for some people to interpret. We have one last one over here. I see a couple more hands that have popped up. Please write those questions down and put those in the, in the, in the question boxes by the exit doors. And then there will be an opportunity for Eric to hopefully pick your questions. Thanks, Eric. That was fantastic. Um, you touched on this idea of uh, an area where we blend between and psychology, and I, I think that's a really important area. I'm really um, that provided we stay within our scope, and we're and we're just limited predominantly to pain. But it's an area that many of the big impact. Sorry, is that working? Mm -hmm. Um, and, I, and I think because we have those long consults and, we're, and that potential for really good rapport that we're really well placed to be implementing this stuff, again, provided we stay within our scope. How would you suggest that manual therapists upskill in these areas like CBT and ACT? Uh, what resources and uh, courses would you suggest? Yeah, um, well, I think that a lot of the work hasn't been done so much. Um, there, there's a lot of resources, and I think you can seek these out. Um, um, you can try to cross over and, 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 and take a class in CBT, especially as it pertains to pain, or take ACT training. Um, but it's not always going to make sense for us to do it exactly how psychologists do it. And I think we have to sort of take what makes sense, because like you said, this merger between the two, um, it's going to look a little bit different, but that's because we get to do so much more than psychologists do. And I think that's really the power that we have. But I think we have to move more towards them than they can move towards us because they've got other things. I don't want to treat depression or you know, bipolar, all that stuff. I don't want to be that. But I think we have to learn how to have a conversation about values, and we have to really be comfortable with emotion existing in, in the treatment context. I think those are the two big things. And I think um, there's. Psychology is as confusing as, 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 as the rehab sciences in terms of techniques and disciplines. I really like behaviorism. I really like act therapy. I really like motivational interviewing. These are some things that I've sort of gravitated towards and found some inspiration from. I'm not saying that that's an exclusive or an exhaustive list. And I'm in school, so maybe I'll have an answer in a couple of years, too. <laughs> Eric Kruger, everyone. Thank you.